In this video, we'll consider a broad overview of some important concepts in experimental design, including treatment design, randomization design, and a bit about um, the relationship between causality and experimental design. Um, we'll also emphasize the difference between an experimental unit and a sample unit. So let's first say something about the relationship between ANOVA and experimental design. And so far in this course, we've studied the mathematical and statistical models that can be used to analyze a particular data format. Data with a continuous response and one or two or potentially more categorical variables as predictors. And we've been calling these predictors factors. Uh, these models that we've studied, they include one-way ANOVA, two-way ANOVA, ANCOVA models. Um, and the ANCOVA models build upon the ANOVA framework by adding one or more continuous predictors. And sometimes in the ANCOVA literature, um, these are called covariates. And the strength of the conclusions that we draw from these models can vary depending on how the data were collected. And in particular, if we hope to make causal conclusions about the relationships between variables and ANOVA. For example, that the new advertising color scheme causes 3% more clicks in internet users, rather than something like the new advertising color scheme is associated with 3% more clicks, then we must take into account, whenever possible, careful design, right? Careful experimental design. And so, in this module, we'll try to understand a little, uh, a little bit about how philosophers and statisticians theorize about causation. And then we'll study some important experimental design concepts that allow us to make well-justified, and in many cases, causal conclusions. And then we'll also apply these concepts to construct real study designs, such as block designs, um, factorial designs, and we'll do that and analyze real data with it. So identifying causal relationships is the goal of much scientific research. But people have thought for a long time about what actually is a cause and what constitutes a cause and effect relationship. So how can we learn about causal relationships? What is a cause? These are really difficult questions and there's some real debate over what the answers might be. Um, we're not going to really attempt to summarize those debates uh, extensively here, but let's try to pose some answers that will allow us to think about experimental design as a way of learning about causal relationships. So philosophers, statisticians, data scientists, computer scientists, many others study the nature of causal relationships. There's no agreed upon definition of causation, but some common approaches include the following three. So the first, uh, the first approach is sometimes called a probabilistic approach. And the main idea here is that causes raise the probability of their effects. So for example, we might say that C causes E if the probability of E given C is greater than just the probability of E alone. So think about what things you might plug in to E and C that would allow you to make sense of this uh, definition. So maybe we might say that rain causes the lawn to be wet if the probability of the lawn being wet, given that it rained, is greater than the probability of just the lawn being wet alone. Now that seems plausible, but you might be able to think of some counterexamples to that. And I encourage you to do so because I might ask you some homework or exam questions about why this particular definition of probabilistic causality doesn't quite capture all that we mean by causality. So how about a second possibility? Second one is a counterfactual definition of causality. And roughly, these theories posit that C causes E if in the absence of C, E would not have occurred or would have been less likely to occur. And the less likely bit sort of merges counterfactual causality potentially with probabilistic causality. And so here you might again try to think about the rain and the lawn being wet example to say that, well, if it hadn't rained, then it would be much less likely for the lawn to be wet or the lawn would not be wet at all, something like that. And many people think that this captures something really important about um, the nature of causal relationships. 
So the last set of approaches that I'll mention are structural equation causation. And this is a bit more complicated and it's a pretty new and active area of research. But the structural equation modeling approach to causation assumes that the claim C causes E must be evaluated relative to a structural equation model. And these models describe a system of interest that is driven by stable stochastic mechanisms. So that all sounds a bit theoretical. The basic idea is that causal relationships must um, come about within uh, a theoretical structure. And that theoretical structure makes certain assumptions. From those assumptions, we can conduct statistical analyses and then use those analyses to maybe go back and decide whether the assumptions are strong enough to assume uh, or maybe they're, they're not strong and we should abandon them. So each of these approaches have benefits and drawbacks. For our purposes, establishing the following conditions will make it reasonable to draw conclusions from experimental data. So we'd like to establish uh, empirical association, and that's a lot of what statistics does. Um, is there a correlation between variables? And if there is, that seems like it's a sort of necessary condition uh, for causation, save for some, you know, really weird cases. Seems like correlation is a necessary condition for causation. We also need the correct temporal relationship. So the predictor, the thing that we put on the right side of the model, comes before the response in time, the response to the thing on the left side of the model. And, you know, we, we want this because we don't think that causes can come after their effects. Right, temporal relationship is important. And the last one that we'll discuss is non-spuriousness. So we want the relationship between the predictor and the response to be not due to changes in some third unaccounted for variable. And you can, you've probably heard lots of examples of uh, spurious relationships. Um, and what we want to try to do with experimental design is to, as much as possible, block uh, the, the possibility of a third variable um, entering but not, but not being known. So note that it's also desirable to know something about the causal mechanism that is a known process that connects variation in the response variable to variation in the predictor variable. And this can strengthen a causal conclusion. So experimental design helps us establish empirical association, temporal relationships, and non-spuriousness. Specifically, experimental concepts such as treatment designs, um, for example, having treatment and control groups, and randomization designs do much of this work. So treatment designs help researchers think clearly about the experimental factors. How many treatments or factors uh, do we want to explore? For example, how many different drugs do we want to study at the same time? How many different advertising campaigns or schemes do we want to explore at the same time? Those are important questions that come up in treatment design. Also, how many levels does each factor or treatment have? Right? You could give different doses of a drug. You can look at several different uh, color schemes within one advertisement campaign. And you also should think about, are there relationships among treatments, right? Are there interactions between these treatments? And also, should we conclude, uh, sorry, should we include and control for continuous covariates, right? Are there continuous variables that we should include in this model that might also do some explaining? So on the other side, uh, randomization designs concern the assignment of treatments to experimental units. What are the experimental units? Do they differ from the sampling units? And we'll talk about that distinction in just a bit. How should we assign treatments to units? Completely at random, randomly within some predefined subgroup or block. How many replications do we need or can we afford, right? Often replication is expensive. And so if we can cut down on the number of replications while still making justified conclusions, we should do so. And so in our study of ANOVA, 
uh, we learn some technical details of treatment designs. Uh, for example, we know that if we have two different experimental treatments, for example, fertilizer treatment and a pesticide treatment, we should decide the number of levels of each treatment and use a two-way ANOVA model uh, where we first test for a statistically significant interaction term between treatments. And so later in this module, we'll discuss two different randomized designs. The first one is a completely randomized design. So that's on the right side of the slide, CRD, completely randomized design. And the other one is a randomized complete block design. So that's RCBD. And uh, we'll talk about the details of blocking, why it might be virtuous to do so. But I think first it will be important to become clear on our definition of an experimental unit and how to distinguish that from a sampling unit. So to become clear about our definition of an experimental unit and how it differs from a sampling unit, let's just remind ourselves of a few maybe more basic definitions. First, the definition of an experiment. So an experiment deliberately imposes a treatment on a group of units in the interest of observing a response. And so earlier, we contrasted this uh, with an observational study, which involves just collecting and analyzing data without changing existing conditions. So an experimental unit uh, is an entity to which a treatment is applied. And examples could include lots of things, so people, animals, plants, tweets, uh, et cetera. And importantly, uh, an experimental unit may not be the same as a sampling unit. So the latter entity uh, is the one on which the response is measured. So a sampling unit by definition is the, an entity on which the response is measured. So to sharpen the distinction, uh, consider the following example. So we've got some company and they perform an experiment to compare the effects of four different advertising campaigns for improving click rates. Uh, and the design looks something like this. There are four social media platforms and they're chosen to host the ad campaigns. And each of these social media platforms will show the ad to a thousand internet users. And experimenters randomly assign each campaign to a different social media platform. In this experiment, uh, the treatment is the advertising campaign, right? That's the thing that's being given to some experimental unit. And the response is um, the number of clicks, right? How, how well is this advertising campaign doing? But the question arises, you know, what is the experimental unit that's actually receiving the treatment? And the answer to this question is consequential. It's gonna change the, um, the legitimacy or uh, how reasonable the analysis is. Uh, so in this case, the experimental unit is not the individual internet user of which there will be 4,000 total, right? A thousand for each social media um, platform. Uh, the experimental unit is the social media platform itself, since social media platforms are the entities to which treatments are applied. And so the users are then the sampling units. Uh, so the distinction might seem trivial, but we will learn that it's not. For example, if you thought that the experimental unit uh, was each user, then you would falsely believe that you had many replications of each ad campaign when in fact you did not have replication uh, because there are four campaigns and four platforms. And so just as a reminder, we mentioned this earlier in the semester also, but a replication is the process of independently assigning the treatment to several experimental units. And so if we think about this example, we've assigned uh, the treatment to social media platforms and then within the social media platform, uh, users click or do not click the ad. And so we don't have replication because we have four social media platforms. We have four different advertising campaigns. And so in a future lesson, 
we'll learn how blocking uh, might help us uh, gain replication here.